repent and believe in the gospel. These words given to us by Christ today aren't just meaningless words. They're really what the whole season of Lent is about. It's a time of repentance, but it's also a time of fulfillment. It's a time for us to recognize why we do what we do. It's because God loves us. The heart of everything, everything we do, is because God loves you. I don't know about you, but for myself, penance was one of those things that I didn't really like as a kid. Talked about that a little bit on Ash Wednesday, where I didn't want to give up my junk food because Valentine's Day was always right beforehand, and in our house, we always got these giant Hershey's Kisses, and then we had to give up chocolate two days later. And then for some reason, they got mad that I ate it in two days. Well, of course I'm going to eat it. I don't want it to go bad. If you've ever ever taken chocolate and put it in the freezer, it gets freeze-dried. It's no good after that. So you either have to eat it in two days or you have to eat it in 50 days because we never got Sundays off during Lent, which technically Sundays don't count in the 40 days of Lent. We hear about Jesus going into the desert today, and he goes into the desert and he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Not for chunks of six days here, six days there, six days there, six days there, that equal 47 days. No, for 40 days and for 40 nights. As we prepare for Lent, as we prepare for Easter, they're both opportunities for us to really refocus our lives on what it is God is calling us to. He's calling us to lives of penance and repentance, as well as to see his love as surpassing any evils. Because the love of God has no obstacles. There's nothing that can hold up to the love of God. Nothing can fight the love of God and win. But for some reason, Satan has told us the lie that that's not true. For some reason, we believe Satan over believing God. We believe many times, or at least I have, I know, in my own life, that we are defined by our sins. That how could God ever love me? Because I've done this or this or that. And the reality is we forgot what our parents told us or should have told us growing up, that God's love is unconditional. Because we've learned conditional love by our families, by our friends, by our priests, by our church. But God's love is unconditional. What does that mean? It means there's no conditions. Nothing can stop the love of God. Nothing. Nothing you do can ever make God love you less. Nothing. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the good news. That no matter how badly we sin, how often we sin, He's always calling us back to repentance, always calling us back to reconciliation, always calling us back to his love. Because there's only one sin that's unforgivable, and it's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't know what that was growing up. I thought that was like taking God's name in vain. It's like, oh no, if God can't forgive that, we're all going to hell. That's one of the commandments. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. No, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not taking the name of the Lord in vain, but don't do that either. (laughs) Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is believing that God does not have the power to forgive your sins, therefore you don't ask his forgiveness. So why is that the only unforgivable sin? Because God's not going to force his forgiveness upon you. It's the only unforgivable sin because if you don't ask for forgiveness, you can't receive it. That's it. Anything and everything else can and will be forgiven if we go to the sacrament of reconciliation with a contrite heart. And that, my brothers and sisters, should give us hope. I'll ask you the same question that I asked last night. How many of you guys like going to confession? Same response. Oh, we had one. Last night we had zero. I would have been part of the zero as well growing up. I hated it. I always thought that going to confession was one of a few things. When I hear confession, I think, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. 
or I feel like I'm being called to the principal's office, or like I'm being put in the penalty box for two minutes for checking somebody. That's all I know about hockey. But that's what I always thought, because you get to slap on the wrists and go out and do it again, right? What do non-Catholic Christians say about Catholics? We send Monday through Friday, go to confession on Saturday, wash, wince, and repeat, right? But if we truly understand what it's about, we realize how that's kind of missing the point. Now, we do do the wash, rinse, and repeat a lot. But look back at the Hebrew scriptures as well, the Old Testament, and see how many times the, the Israelites, the Jews, had that same process. God gives us the Ten Commandments. We're going to make a bull out of gold and worship it. God condemns us. We apologize. He gives us penance. Wash, rinse, and repeat. Sacrament of reconciliation kind of follows that same pattern. We are given absolution. We go out and told to sin no more. We go out, we sin even more. We come back, contrite of heart. But that's not what it's about. The sacrament of reconciliation isn't just about washing our hands. We've learned how to do that very, very well this last year. But that's not what it's about. The sacrament of reconciliation is about reconciling your relationship reconciliation with God and with humanity. When Christ came, he said, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And I leave you these, these two great commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. The problem is we forgot that first part. And we do love our neighbors as we love ourselves. But since we identify ourselves by our sins, we do really, really well at pointing the finger at other because of their sins too. So we at least got one of them right. Not how he wanted us to get it right. <laughs> but we do really, really well at judging others. Because it's so easy to talk bad about our brothers and sisters. Just turn on social media for five seconds. It's sad how many people have gotten off of social media, not just for Lent, but because of the election. Don't worry, I'm not, not talking politics. But it's so sad how divided we are. Through our baptisms, my brothers and sisters, we are members of the body of Christ. We are called to lift each other. We are called to be united. I mean, we live in the United States of America that have never been more divided except for maybe during the Civil War. We understand us versus them so well. The only them is Satan. Because that's how we treat everybody else. That's not us, right? We treat them like the worst people in the world. Like they are truly our enemies. We've got to smash them. What did Christ say about your enemies? Love your enemy. Love your enemy. Pray for your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Oh, but Father, one bruise is bad enough. Do I really have to have two? Yes. But it hurts. Yeah, it does. Love really hurts. If you want proof of it, look up on the cross. What did Christ tell us? There's no greater love, says the Lord, than to lay down your life for your friends. What did Christ call his disciples before he was crucified? I no longer call you servants. I call you my friends. His act of love for those disciples is the same act of love that he offers to each and every one of us. The gift of salvation that his blood paid the price for he didn't just pay once, but he pays for all time. And that's what these five young people, young people, these five candidates and catechumens are about to enter into as they write their names in the book of the elect. They're preparing themselves during this season of Lent to be members of the body of Christ. We should be proud to be members of the body of Christ. I can remember being a teenager and we always prayed as a family before meals. But if I went out to a restaurant, I'd be like, what? But then I realized that I was ashamed to be a Christian. Not just a Christian, but a Catholic. 
Because if you do this, we're the only ones that do that. Unless you're on a sports field and then everybody does it. I don't understand that, but... But the reality, my brothers and sisters, we should not be ashamed. We should wear our faith on our sleeves. We shouldn't have to go out and say, hey, did you know I'm a Catholic? Our actions should show it. One of the saddest moments of my priesthood was asking the high school kids at Bishop McGinnis one day, why do so many people hate the Catholic Church? The response was, because they're all a bunch of hypocrites. They say to love your neighbor, and they're the first ones to tear us down. Broke my heart. And then I had to realize that they were talking to me too. That I'm a hypocrite. That I'm a Pharisee. Because I don't always get it right. But man, do I try. <laughs> But remember, we call it practicing the faith. Has anybody ever called it perfecting the faith? Anybody? What does practice involve? Failure. You are going to fail at your journey. At one way or another, you're going to fall. And that's okay. One of the biggest signs of hope we see on these walls around us when we look at the Stations of the Cross Christ says, pick up your cross and follow me. What does Christ not say? Pick up your cross and follow me by yourself. Christ fell three times on his way to Golgotha. But three times he got back up. And when he couldn't do it himself, Simon the Cyrenian was pressed into service to help him back up. We, as members of the body of Christ, are called to lift each other up, not to bear the weight of our crosses by ourselves, because if we do, we're not getting back up. That's why we have to rely on each other. That is what we call the Catholic Church. That's what we call the Christian faith. That's why when we are baptized, we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit not just in the name of some random priest, bishop, or martyr. Because I'm imperfect. He's not. And that, my brothers and sisters, is what Christ is talking about. When he tells us to repent, he's telling us, seek out my grace and mercy. Why do you want to live in a world that is marred by sin? As kids, we like to play in the mud, but eventually we want to get cleaned afterwards, right? But for some reason, we love to play with sin, and we don't know why we have to be cleaned of it. Oh, but Father, I haven't committed any mortal sins. I haven't murdered anybody, and I haven't committed adultery. Congratulations. That's a good step. But those aren't the only sins. Gossip. Speeding. I've seen you guys in the parking lot, and I'm only my first weekend. Just saying. But we have all of these minor sins that we forget about. We're called to confess those sins as well. We're called to always have our mind and our eye on perfection, striving for it, even though we know we will never reach it. Because a life lived with happiness and joy is possible. But it means living a life based in love. Some of you that I've talked to in the last week or so, I've told this story to. But the last um, Mass that I celebrated with my dad at Bishop McGinnis was actually the day that we all had to quarantine. And the homily that I preached that day was on the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That prayer alone has got me through the last four months. Because I realize there's things that I can't affect. When the bishop called me into his office, and I knew what was coming <laughs> when I was being moved here. To the point of, I got the phone call the day before I started Googling Elk City to see what there was to do in Elk City. 
There's an indoor putt-putt. I found it. There's a lot of other things to do here as well. But I also Googled St. Matthews. We're going to be working on our, our email. We're going to be working on our website. Because it doesn't say much right now. It's got the basics, mass times, bulletin, confession times. But there, we're so much more than that. If any of you guys came out on Friday night, the beauty of the fish fry, oh my goodness. We had almost 350 people packed the line, because they couldn't eat here, but packed the line to support our youth. That is amazing. We had more people in line than we'll have at Mass this weekend. That's not quite as amazing. Now, I know that there are many of you that are live streaming right now. My prayer is that we can get you here sooner rather than later. Get your vaccine. Come to Mass. The majority of us are wearing masks. For those that aren't, I ask that you please do. A lot of that is because I know that Father Philip died from COVID, so did my dad. And I was at a parish where they wore masks at a funeral and half of the parish ended up getting COVID because they touched the doorknob. So it's not just the mask, there are other things we have to take care of. Socially distancing, it's hard for me. I, I'm a hugger. I haven't hugged anyone outside of my family in like a year. Shaking hands is the closest I can get. But then I've got the sanitizer. Because I don't want to give you anything, and I don't want you to give me anything. Because I love you. Just meeting you, but I love you. Because God loves me. Do I deserve it? No. I don't deserve God's love. Neither do you. But he's going to give it to us anyways. And that, my brothers and sisters, is what it's all about all about embracing God's love. It's all about embracing his mercy and his forgiveness. So my brothers and sisters, I plead with you during this Lenten season to listen to the words from Scripture because this is the time of fulfillment. What are we waiting for? The kingdom of God is at hand. Truly repent and believe in the gospel. <laughs>